Well, happy Easter or happy Resurrection Sunday to you all, uh, to you all again. And you all are some beautiful people. We all are some beautiful people. Amen. Listen, we've been, we've been in a series these last couple of weeks, and today is just sort of a culmination of wrapping that up. And so um, we're just excited that we can just worship together on today. And so I simply just, just have a small uh, sermon title on today, but between both contemporary and traditional, we're talking about Easter faith. On today, we're talking about Easter faith. Uh, but I simply want to just leave you with the subtitle that God has moved on. God has moved. On. If you will, just turn to your neighbor, somebody that may not be your spouse or significant other, and tell them, I'm moving on. <laughs> Try to help you. I'm trying 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 to help you. Don't want to start another on Easter Sunday. I want to start Easter Sunday. How about you join me just for a quick word of prayer? God, you are as real today as you were 2,000 years ago. So I pray that today that in our worship and our singing and our praying and our preaching that we see and feel your realness. This is the day that we celebrate your resurrection. I'm excited that you have brought people together from different walks of life, from those who are watching online, from those in the room. God, we've come today with so many questions and maybe concerns, and yet in the midst of all of that, we are reminded that you rose above. Anything that we're going through, you rose above. Any questions, you, you rose above because you are as real today as you were 2,000 years ago. So God, we stand on your prayer that when the word goes out, it shall not come back void. This is our prayer. In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen. Easter faith, when God moves on. I want to begin just by suggesting today that all of us believe or have faith in something. In fact, when you woke up this morning, you, when you placed your feet on the ground, you believed, you believed that there was some gravitational force that would hold your feet to the ground. You believed that when you turned on the faucet that water would magically come forward. You, you, you believe and have faith in something. You, you believe that you look good in your Easter outfit on today. All of us believe and have faith in something. We have faith in our mode of transportation. We have, we have faith in the other cars that were out on the road. All of us believe and have faith in something but as a people we don't suffer from a lack of things to believe in every day of our lives we put into practice all of the things and the people that we believe in where we often lose our faith is when we are let down by the people or things that held our trust it's when something disrupts this belief system and so here's the question on this Easter Sunday. Have you ever believed in something and have been let down or disappointed? Have you ever believed in something and have been let down or disappointed? It's when people who love us hurt us. It's when the driver doesn't go fast enough at a roundabout, when there are clearly no cars coming. It's an Indianapolis problem for those of you who are watching online, right? It's when the system that we trust fails us. Sometimes our biggest hurdle is not the absence of faith or the, or the absence of belief, but it's dealing with the residue when things fail or let us down. It's where we find Mary in our text. It must have been hard for her that morning. It must have been hard for a lot of people because Mary believed in this man called Jesus. 
She believed in his vision. She believed in his potential. She had faith that he could make a difference. There was no question about it. Mary Magdalene had faith in Jesus. I mean, I mean Mary Magdalene was one of Jesus' most devout followers. In fact, she, she provided funds and resources out of her own means. I mean, when they would go from city to city, she would help fund their ministry. Why? Because she believed and had faith in this man they called Jesus of Nazareth. And considering her story, church, it makes sense. I mean, Mary is described as one whom seven spirits have gone out of. It lets us know that Jesus healed her of some things that she had been going through in her life. And let's be honest, all of us have our own demons that we deal with on a daily basis. Somebody say amen. amen. So you can imagine how grateful Mary would have been to this carpenter from Nazareth because he has healed her from the very things that she may have been struggling with her whole entire life. And her gratefulness did not just stop at mere words because Mary stayed by his side for the rest of his ministry, even unto death. Here's why I'm telling you this, because this is not just anybody that's showing up to his tomb. This is, this is somebody that believed. This is somebody that had faith. This is somebody that gave their time and their money and their resources her entire life. And now he's dead. This was somebody that believed in something that has now been tragically let down. And it's really hard to come back from a letdown like this. Have you, have you ever believed in something and have been let down? That's why, that's why I really admire Mary because it takes a whole lot of courage to go back to the very place where your dreams have died and just do your best. I have, I have a lot of respect for Mary because it takes a lot of strength to show up in difficult places. I got a lot of respect in Mary because you have to be a special kind of person to show up even when things seem as though you were dead wrong. I mean, can you imagine the kind of resolve it took to gather up those spices to anoint the body of Jesus and make that journey to the very place that represents her being tragically led? down because she was one that believed I mean let's let's look at this a different way this wasn't just a tomb for a decomposed body but it was the grave and burial grounds for so much more I mean that one body that was in the grave it represented the future that she thought he would bring it represented the life that she had imagined. It represented a reality that she had placed so many of her hopes and dreams and belief in. I mean, she imagined a world and an empire that he would overthrow. She pictured the work that they would do together. Maybe she saw the role that she would play, but all of this was now gone. Buried behind the stones, See, it wasn't just one body, but it was the hopes and dreams of an entire nation. Tens and thousands of hopes and dreams had been put to death. And not just, not just faith and belief in Jesus Christ, but that's not the way being let down does. I mean, can you imagine her faith in people has probably been shot? Her faith in her own judgment, loss, her faith in, in the fact that she can make a difference in the future, all of that is now lost. Have you ever been let down? But when Mary gets to the tomb, she looks inside and realizes that the tomb is empty. She sees that the stone has been rolled away and tells the other disciples something very interesting. In fact, did you catch what she says? She comes, she comes, now I don't mean this in a, in a judgmental way, but she comes to a very interesting conclusion. Somebody say the plot thickens. <laughs> she says, watch what she, she says, somebody has stolen the body of Jesus and we don't know where they put him. 
Now, I think Mary, at least that's what I imagine in my mind, that she seems like a kind and nice individual. It doesn't seem like she likes a whole lot of drama. But when I'm reading the text, there's nothing in there that says that the body has been stolen by anybody and they have taken them off. There's some somewhere or another. She has, she has completely made up this story on the spot. Where in the world does she come up with this story? She goes in, sees an empty tomb. Now all of a sudden, some robbers and thieves, they come and roll the stone away, stolen Jesus and taking Jesus away. There's nothing that suggests that anybody has stolen this man's body. She has conjured up the story all. Uh, listen, I'm not saying this in a judgmental way. I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you about the text. But this is where people lose their faith. Because many people lose their faith in the space between my assumptions and my reality. See, we conjure up ideas in our minds from the limited information that we have, and now perception becomes reality. And in, in fact, the reality is that the way we see things governs the way we live. If she thinks his body has been stolen, she will govern and live her life with that mentality. If I assume nobody loves me, that becomes the way that I govern how I live. If I assume that my faults and failures are too much to overcome, that becomes the narrative of how I live my life. We stare at the empty tombs every day of our lives and think the worst. We assume, and so many people lose their faith in between their assumptions and their reality. And we laugh at Mary, but how often do we look at certain situations and we assume things, and you know what happens You see, something doesn't have to be true for it to greatly impact your life. In fact, let me prove it. A few weeks ago, I met with one of my colleagues, and I thought he was my friend. I, I, I thought this colleague was my friend, uh, but you'll see why I'm questioning that now, because we're, we're in the process of starting this online campus. Yeah, smile. She, yeah, we're in the process of starting this online campus, so I figured that I dive more into the options of, of how people are, are connecting with each other in this new reality. So, so, so this new friend of me of mine, uh, who works with our middle and high schoolers, invited me to check out his virtual reality headset. And um, what I didn't know, what I didn't know, well, let me say this, how many of you have ever tried the virtual reality headsets before? Wow, you all are on it, okay. So, so, so now, this was my first time, and let me just give, it, give an endorsement that once you put the headset on, right, it totally changes what you think is reality, right? What I didn't know is that my frenemy was recording. <laughs> he was recording the experience. Now, the first one we did was walking the plank. He didn't tell me what was going on. He put the plank down as he was setting up the virtual reality uh, headset. He put a two by four uh, on the floor, and all you had to do was put the headset on, and all you had to do was walk across the two by four that was on the plank. That's all you had to do. But in virtual reality, it, it begins to change your perception and what you think is real. In fact, take a look. Let me show you how far I got. Let me show you how far I got. All right. All right. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. I'm getting it. Come on, Jay. You got it. I'm almost there. Oh, that's just me, bro. No, no, no. Good deal. 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 It was too real. You were on top of a skyscraper, and I took the glasses off. I, I, I saw that it wasn't real, but something doesn't have to be real in order to impact your life. Right? So, 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 so the next one, we played a boxing game. 
Take a look. crazy don't I <laughs> why because it's not real but it was to me something doesn't have to be real to impact your life but the way that you see something determines how you live maybe God is trying to remind somebody today that it's not real the narrative that you've been telling yourself and the reality and the story that you have painted by looking into some of the areas of your life, it's not real. Because many people lose their faith in between the assumption and the reality. Some of us have been walking in virtual reality for years now, making assumptions about yourself, making assumptions about God, making assumptions about possibilities, not even based on something that's real. We look just as crazy as I did. Because it's only a figment of the world that we've created in our minds. She said, somebody has stolen the body of Jesus, and where did they take them? So even without headsets, we create our own realities. What world have you created for yourself? Because sooner or later, grief creates a reality. Fear creates a reality. Disappointment creates a reality. And we make assumptions about God. But something happens, and we think God doesn't love us. We create the reality. Things don't go as planned, and we assumed that it says something about us. It's the reality that we're creating in our minds. We see an empty tomb and imagine everything is lost. Instead of saying a Savior that has risen, Mary wasn't wearing a headset. But she was def definitely creating her own reality. So Mary, in her grief, hears someone inside of the tomb talking, and Christ meets her inside of the tomb, and she doesn't even recognize his voice. In fact, yeah, I'm, I'm in this in a judgmental way. She thinks it's the gardener. <laughs> She's like stretching this story and narrative, right? She, think, she thinks it's the gardener until, until Jesus calls her name. Doesn't have to provide any more evidence. All Jesus does is say Mary and she turns towards him and realizes that it is the same Jesus that she put her trust in. You see, this is a universal act, but it now it's becoming personal. She wasn't the only one that showed up to the tomb that day, but God calls her by name, not by position, not by title, not by all of the things that she was going through. But God is, is watch this, God is big enough to, to rise from the grave, but small enough to remember your name. Let's be honest, let's be honest. Some people you see every day and they forget your what? We recognize their faces but not their what? You see, the resurrection is not just a sign of God's power, but it's a display of God's intentional decision to show up in the places and the people that need him the most. I think what gets lost in our retelling of this and that's even so critical to our faith are the very personal implications of Christ's resurrections. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab a pen or a piece of paper or open up the notes or your phone. If you're watching online, I want to get at least 85% participation. If you're watching online, I want you to type this into the chat because I want to show you, I want to show you of, 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 of why God chose 
to rise again from the grave. And, and you are going to write the most important reason why Jesus allowed himself to be arrested. You're going to write down the most important reason why Jesus decided to go through all of this. So, so bring up your notes, bring up your chat, bring up your pen. And does, does anybody even carry a pen and a piece of paper anymore? You're about five of y'all. Okay, all right, all right, all right. So, 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 so this, this will be the most important thing I say all day, all day, all day. Because this, this is the reason of why we're celebrating Easter today. This, this is the reason. You ready for it? Okay. My wife shook her head. Thank you. Sir. Are you, are you ready for the answer? Okay, now I want you to write this answer down. I want you to write this answer down. The most important reason why God decided to go through all of that, to be arrested, to be handed over, to be crucified, to be buried, and to rise again, the answer is this. And I want you to keep it. I want you to screenshot it because it's going to be your reminder when uh, your reality starts to change and you need a reminder of why Christ did what he did. I want you to write your name. I want you to write your name. He goes unto the empty tomb. He does not preach a sermon. He does not perform a miracle. He does not heal. All he does is call a name. All he does is call Mary's name. And that's what Christ is doing today. Christ is calling your name. Lisa, Christ is calling your name. Kim, Christ is calling your name. Kristen, Christ is calling your name. Travis, we frenemies, but Christ, <laughs> Christ is calling your name. You, you were enough. Mary was enough for him to show up in a grave in an empty tomb because she was enough. And when life begins to alter your reality and what you think and what you experience, you need a reminder of why Christ did what he did and your name has to be enough. Every time you write it down, it's a reminder, I'm enough. Every time somebody says your name, it's a reminder now that it's enough. That was enough for her to realize that this was the son of God. Because remember, she's invested everything to follow him. And there's no way that she's letting him go now. I mean, what a, what a tender moment, right? This woman that believes. And Jesus, Jesus, Jesus um, calls her name. What a, what a tender moment, right? Absolutely not. Because Jesus says, back up off me. That's what my translation says. That's what it, right? That's what it, the, Jesus discourages her from holding on because therein lies the temptation of believing in something and acquiring faith. Our biggest obstacle of faith is too often the temptation is to hold on. We try so hard to hold on to what is that we don't leave room for what can be. See, I don't think this is just a physical embracing, but it's a, it's a holding on to the Jesus that she had always known. Because here's the scariest part of faith. Now, this is, this is, it messes people up 100% of the time. This is the scariest part of faith. It messes people up all of the time because she knows him as Jesus of Nazareth. She knows him as Jesus that went throughout the towns. She knows him as Jesus that could be in one place at one time. So here's, here's, the, here's the most challenging part of faith. The hardest part of faith is that we have to let go of the Jesus that we knew to embrace the Jesus that is. 
She knew that Jesus in the tomb, but Jesus was about to reveal more of himself that was going to be different. He's trying to tell her that my goal is not to stay in this grave that I have to ascend to my father. In other words, in other words, I got to move on. It's a, it's a great moment, but I got to move on. His reason for rising and resurrection was not to stay where she found him. See, we often say that Jesus doesn't leave us how we found us, but the reverse is also true. You can't leave Jesus the same way you found him because faith moves us from where we last saw him to where God is leading us now. In fact, let me, let me, let me put it to you this way. Have you, have you ever had to move? How many of you have ever had to move? How many, how many love moving? <laughs> right, right, right. Because, because, because it's the process of moving that's difficult. And, one of the, and, and, and whenever you've had to move, whenever you've had to move, you've had to fill out one of these. You've had to fill out one of these. Sooner or later, you got to fill out a change of address because it's letting the world know that in order to reach you, they have to look for where you're going and not where you've been. It's an indication that you've moved on. It's a process of letting anyone that wants to connect with you that they can't look for you where they last saw you. It alerts the entire system that you can no longer be reached at your former location. Jesus was verbally, verbally filling out the information as they spoke because you can be searching for Jesus in an experience or a place where Jesus is no longer present. Good idea, but wrong place. And many people go through life holding on to the Jesus that they knew holding on to the faith that they had, holding on to the beliefs that they had, holding on to the people ab about the world, about ourselves, but the resurrection did not occur to, uh, the, the resurrection did not come to affirm what we believe, but to challenge it. The presence of Christ challenges what we believe about death, what we believe about suffering, what we believe about God, what we believe about ourselves. So are you open to experiencing God in new ways? Are you open to experiencing God in new ways? Because let's, let's face it, this is, a, this, is a, this is an odd move by an individual. I mean, she comes to the tomb with spices to anoint Jesus' body. She hasn't figured out how she's going to roll away the stone. She hasn't figured out how she's going to get past the guards. She is clearly not in, in she is clearly not in Enneagram one. Clearly, I mean, she has she has figured out no details. But maybe that's what faith is. Maybe that's what Easter faith is. Maybe Easter faith today is moving on from where we were, even when we don't have all the answers. Maybe we just figure it out when we get there. You don't know how it was going to be raising kids, but what'd you do? You figured it out. You didn't know what you were doing on your first job, but what did you do? You figured it out. Nobody gives you a manual of how to deal with aging parents, but what do you do? Some of us are waiting to make a move for God until everything is figured out. Maybe Christ is just giving us permission today to just move on. Maybe move on from grief to joy. Move on from sorrow to peace. Move on from death to resurrection. But move on from the tomb to purpose. Christ doesn't want you to stay where you are. And we don't want Jesus to stay in the tomb. It's an invitation to see when it's time for us to move on. And that's good news. That's Easter faith. I want you to pray with me. Thank you. 
God, it's often difficult because we want to hold on to who we know you to be. We want to hold on to the God that we know. We want to hold on to the way life used to be. And sometimes we want to hold on to the way things were before we met you. We want to hold on to our experience of you. But maybe that's not enough. Maybe, maybe you are bigger than our denominations. Maybe, maybe, maybe you are bigger than our cities. Maybe you are bigger than our continents. Maybe you're bigger than our world. Maybe, maybe we have placed you in graves and didn't know it. Maybe in some areas of our lives we were hoping that you would just stay there, stay in the tomb so we could hold on to you. And maybe you're even bigger than that. So we want to follow you wherever you go. Even if we don't have all the answers, everything figured out. Everybody believes and trusts in something. And today we want to believe and have faith in you. This is our prayer in Christ's name we pray. Amen.